who I spoke to, Josh Frydenberg, earlier. Treasurer, thanks very much for your time. Nice to be with you. We're out of recession, but do you accept for millions of people looking for work, it won't feel like that? Well, technically, the recession is over in Australia, but Australia's economic recovery still has a long way to go. And there are a lot of Australians who are doing it tough right now. A lot of sectors that continue uh, to find it difficult uh, in the face of this once-in-a-century pandemic and the greatest economic shock since the Great uh, Depression. But what we've seen in today's uh, GDP numbers, Kieran, is the biggest single quarterly increase uh, since 1976 at 3.3% growth. It's better than what the market was expecting at 2.5%. Uh, it does show that the labour market strengthening is helping the economy overall and obviously the government is continuing to do everything it can to support Australians through this crisis. On this trajectory, uh, no more lockdowns, you know, fingers crossed that, that happens. When do we get back to the pre-COVID levels of spending and, and growth? Well, this has seen a big increase in household consumption of 7.9%. It was the single biggest contributor to the numbers today. Household consumption are about 60% of GDP, and they had a big fall in June as Australians were confined to their homes and couldn't go out to a tourist destination or to a hotel, to a cafe, to a restaurant. We've seen a big jump uh, in the numbers today in that sort of discretionary uh, spending. So that is a positive sign. As long as the virus is controlled on the health front, I'm confident that the speed and the trajectory of our economic recovery will go in the right direction. One of the things the OECD points to mm. is the insolvency issue. Yeah. Are you expecting a cliff in that sense of insolvencies once those emergency measures are removed in, within months? Well, our reforms are key. Uh, in, in respect of the insolvency changes, because what we did during COVID, Kieran, is we put some temporary relief. We lifted the, stat the thresholds for the statutory demands that could be made on uh, insolvent firms, and that has meant that a number of those businesses that were doing tough have been protected uh, through to the end of the year. But then that will morph into this new system, uh, provided it gets through the parliament before the end of the year, and I'm hopeful of getting bipartisan support for that. And that will allow businesses that have come on hard times to trade through some of their challenges. Because as you know, um, as the health restrictions are raised, a lot of those businesses who did it tough over June, July, August, even September, are starting to get their customers back. So will that avoid that cliff of insolvencies well, there, there, that many are expecting? There, there will be some businesses that don't survive. There will be some jobs that can't be saved. But we're confident that the unemployment rate will continue to track downwards uh, and that the economic support that we're providing to the economy uh, will help keep people in jobs. You sounded very, you know, quite, if not very, um, bullish in the news conference saying we're better placed than any country. With the health story as it is, and if their vaccines do roll out within the next few months, hopefully within the first quarter of next year, are we, are we expecting growth of upwards of 5%? Is that sort of where you're thinking? Well, what we showed in today's... Um, uh, numbers was that every state and territory, bar Victoria, had strong economic growth. If Victoria had the growth numbers that we saw on average across the other states and territories, then the number today would have been 5%, not 3.3%. So it's very pleasing that the situation in Victoria is now under control. That augurs well uh, for, for the next set of numbers. That being said, the virus remains, and we've seen, Kieran, with the South Australian experience recently, that that dented confidence when there was a short lockdown. So we, we don't know what's around the corner. The vaccine trials uh, are looking positive, so we're hopeful about a vaccine. Uh, but again, uh, this virus is persistent, it's deadly, uh, and we need to always remain vigilant. New South Wales want international students back as soon as possible. They're pushing for that to be a part of the the numbers coming in. Should the federal government be backing them in that endeavour, given we're talking about our third biggest export, foreign students? Well, we've also got Australians that we're seeking to bring back as well. And as you know, we're, we've been successful in bringing tens of thousands of Australians uh, back home, but there are still many more that are wanting to come. 
Uh, so we need to work through um, those numbers as well, working with the states who have been running the hotel quarantine uh, programs. It's pleasing again that Victoria will start to take um, some numbers as well after you know their lockdown, which meant that they didn't take um, those uh, those people coming in from abroad. So we will obviously over time see more students come back. But again, that's going to be very dependent on international borders opening up. That's going to be very dependent on on the success too and the speed of the vaccine. The OECD also points to one of the other issues, not just insolvencies, but another way on the outlook is the China relationship. Mm. How much is at stake in getting that, getting well, that back on track, back on an even keel? Well, China's our number one trading partner. It's worth 200, more than $200 billion a year in terms of its two-way trading relationship, and it has increased substantially under us. That being said, it's no secret, Kieran. There are some uh, challenges in that relationship. There are um, some difficulties on the trade front. That might be an understatement. They're, they're, they're significant and they're serious. Now, we would like to work through those on a bilateral level, but if that's not possible, we retain the options to use multilateral forums. But, but do you need to it react... Is, it is a significant relationship. Do you need us. to react to wolf warrior diplomacy? That's what it's called. The Chinese... and don't, are not great at soft power, are they? I mean, they're, they're, the diplomacy is something, obviously, for a great power that, that is lacking. Do we need to react to the wolf warrior sort of diplomacy with emotion and outrage, or do you oh, just let it, it, let it, it slide? If you're, if you're talking about that doctored photo, um, then that was hugely insulting uh, and completely unnecessary. So the Prime Minister was absolutely right yeah, to speak it, very strongly about that. It was reprehensible, that. but does the Prime, is the Prime Minister the one that needs to do it? I mean, it was reprehensible, it was disgraceful, I mean, everyone agrees with that, but is it the PM that needs to respond to a mid-ranking official? Well, again, as the leader of our country, uh, he speaks for our nation, and you would find it hard to find somebody across the country who wasn't offended by that, uh, and particularly the insult to our armed forces as well. That being said, the Chinese have put out a list of 14 grievances and um, it, those grievances list everything from our free press to our democratically elected parliament. Um, and whether it's decisions around foreign investment, whether it's decisions around national security, uh, whether it's decisions around foreign interference, we'll take those in the national interest. That makes sense. And you wouldn't expect us to walk back from that? No, uh, no, no one would expect us to walk back from that. But as the former Prime Minister Kevin Rudd says, should we be doing more and speaking less? Because that's all in the national interest, you're right, and we should definitely be doing that, have security agencies managing all that stuff where needed. But by the same token, it's also in our national interest to keep our largest trading partner on an even keel in terms of that relationship. That's also in our national interest. But, but those issues that I just raised with you, free press, democratically elected parliament, um, foreign investment, um, national security, uh, foreign interference, um, all of those issues are really important to Australia and some of those issues go to the heart of our identity, let alone to the heart of our national security. And so therefore we're going to continue uh, to defend those national interests and, and that will be a consistent and clear position from the Australian government. But does there come a time where you need to ignore the inflammatory messages, if not to just simply not amplify well, that we, sort of thing. We would like to engage in a mutually beneficial and respectful dialogue um, with our Chinese counterparts, but to date um, that has not occurred. One final question goes to uh, comments by Governor Lowe today. He praised the New South Wales government for its reforms in terms of stamp duty. Can we expect any reform from the federal government in May or will you maintain a, a less ambitious strategy? Well, firstly, Governor Lowe has speak, spoken very favourably about the government's economic response and our economic policy, and he has praised it as being the right policy. With respect to the most recent budget, uh, it was a budget for the times. Uh, the economy had been hit by the biggest uh, economic shock since the Great Depression. And there was obviously new support to get people into work, like the job maker hiring yeah. credit. But there was also big incentives to encourage more investment, to get a private sector-led recovery. See, one of the key differences between us and, dare it say, it, our political opponents, is we don't see government as the solution. We see government as a catalyst mm -hmm. for that solution. The private sector 
can help lead this recovery and that's why we put in place a series of incentives to encourage them to hire, to innovate, to, to invest and, and to grow. Now, with respect to the reforms that we've already outlined, whether it's on insolvency, whether it's responsible lending, whether it's in superannuation, these are very significant reforms that were in this year's budget when it comes to the tax cuts. Yes, we brought forward by two years stage two, but at the heart of those tax cuts, which we've legislated through the Parliament, which the Labor Party seemed to be walking away from, is the abolition of a whole tax bracket and having one single tax bracket at 30 cents in the dollar between $45,000 and $200,000, where the bulk of Australian workers will be, Kieran. Now, that strengthening of our tax system will not only make it better and fairer, but it will encourage aspiration and reward for effort. And that goes to the heart of the Coalition's philosophy. Treasurer, appreciate it, as always. Thanks. Good to be with you.